and welcome everyone. My name is Gladys Rama. I'm the editorial director at redmanmad.com and I am so, so pleased to be moderating the first session as well as welcoming you to our Identity and Access Management for Windows Enterprises Summit. This one has been brought to you by the very kind folks at Zoho and Tools Forever. They, along with the editorial staff at redmanmag.com, have worked really hard to bring together some of the best independent experts on this topic for this event, so we really hope that you enjoy it. Before we get started with the first of these three great sessions, we do have a couple of announcements. First, this event is being recorded and it will be available to you for future viewing. So keep an eye out for an email from us. We'll send you a link to the replay when it's available, generally in the next couple of days. Second, each of today's three sessions will be followed by a five to 10 minute Q&A. So please be sure to put your questions into the Q&A area of your console as they come up. We're gonna to try to get to as many of them as we can for each session. Third, after the third session today, we are giving away an uni pizza oven, but you have to be present to win, so be sure to stay off for the entire event. And finally, we have resources from our sponsors, Zoho and Tools Forever, that are available for you right now on the console. So please do download them, check them out, read through them. It's because of Zoho and Tools Forever underwriting this content that we can bring you to Summit. So we thank them for sponsoring the Summit and supporting the community. And we ask you to check out those resources so we can bring you more events in the future. Now on to the first session of today's summit, you're in for a good one. This one, this session is called Top Identity and Access Management Pain Points for Windows Enterprises. And it features none other than Ian Thornton Trump, CISO at Cyjax, and frequent speaker with our summit here. Ian is an ICIL certified IT pro with 25 years of experience in IT security and information technology. For many years, he served with the Canadian Forces and the Military Intelligence Branch, and he, enjoyed, he had joined the Canadian Forces Military Police Reserve, retiring as a public affairs officer in 2013. Today, as Chief Information Security Officer at SciJax and CTO of Optify Managed Services, Ian has deep experience with the threats facing SMBs and enterprises, and it's made him a much sought after cybersecurity consultant specializing in building security operations, working as a virtual CISO, and we're so happy to have, the, have him back here with us again. Thanks so much for being here, Ian. I will now give you the floor. Oh, thank you so much. It's always great to hear that. It's always humbling in a way. What I will tell you, those folks, right now, as I am in the belly of the beast, I am at InfoSec Europe right now that is taking place in London at the Excel Center. So if some random crazy stuff happens, I do apologize, but we'll try and keep focus and we'll try and keep things on track. There you can see my biography. Please reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at fat underscore hobbit. And, of course, I'm pretty easy to find with a hyphenated name with a kind of dodgy potential presidential candidate on the end there. Um, listen, I, the reality is is that where we are right now is really important in this moment when we talk about identity and access management. And there's no question that identity and access management and the focus of identity and access management is really on zero trust. Now, let's just, let's just take a breath and let's try and sort out the marketing hype from the reality when we deal with this particular, uh, when we try to unpick this particular um, marketing idea. Now, to be fair, Zero Trust, uh, according to Gartner, has got a really great growth strategy. And this, this needs to be taken into context of the fact that, yes, this is an important aspect. But you know what, folks? The actual understanding that I bring to the table today is an understanding that Zero Trust is really actually an undoing of the past sins that we have that we have put there. Now, I'm going to bring out a number of points in this particular introduction and kind of give you a little bit of an overview of how I see things. Now, 
the problem that we have right now with SaaS and with with the, with pushing a lot of the IT responsibilities onto different vendors of different products is that the security organization, even some people would suggest the IT organization is not able to keep up to the, to the evolution of where the business needs to be. This is complicated by the cloud providers which are advocating this shared security responsibility model, which is very difficult when you put it into the context of SaaS offerings. It's really difficult to understand what is within their Apple cart and what is within your Apple cart as being ultimately the custodian of the data that you're consuming, processing, and whatnot. And, you know, we, we do need to understand that within that framework, there are a lot of questions around compliance. There's a lot of questions around due diligence in terms of, like, handling the data. Uh, one of the TLDRs from this particular presentation is, is that if you have ad, uh, had advocated your responsibility as a custodian of customer data, you cannot then turn around and blame a third party for data breach. This puts the organization into a very difficult position. So fundamentally, you need to have this awareness of everything that's going on within something that we like to call the IT supply chain, which is going to be a huge thing that we're going to talk about in this presentation moving forward. Now, one of the reasons I, I, went, I am going to go back to this is I said at the very beginning of this, I said that um, we are trying to undo this since the past. Anyone that has been in IT for a while understands that most of the protocols that we're dealing with that are at the fundamental levels of the of the you know the OSI model, but at the fundamental levels of the internet and how it all works, they're untrusted. They are not encrypted. They are not something that we can really assure ourselves in terms of any level of security. What what that actually means is that when we push up into the, our particular security model, there are many things under the zero trust framework that I'm going to be kind of purporting here, when we, specifically when we talk to identity and access management, is that we are not really 100% sure on the basic levels of our infrastructure. This presents a huge problem that, you know, as you know today, and some of us out there might be of military persuasions, the uh, SHI asterisk T uh, rolls downhill. So what we need to understand fundamentally is that we are building our systems on a flawed um, level to begin with, and we are struggling to try and figure out how we can trust what is essentially untrusted. This got complicated, especially in the COVID years, where we ended up in a position where we were now assuming that there was a level of trust on endpoints and work from home that, that essentially was managed less. Like, we didn't. We, we weren't able to see a lot of the activity that was going on on those endpoints because we didn't. We weren't into the actual networks where the activity was taking place. What we could see is stuff at our firewall, but we could not see the actual endpoint behavior. This made for uh, for a very difficult mission for IT security and IT um, providers, IT um, teams to the point where my heart goes out to you guys because this was a really rough go. And this rough go has continued as, you know, businesses realize that maybe we don't need as strong an on-premise network as, um, as, as is required. So what, what has essentially happened is BYOD and work from home is now becoming a default, especially in some countries and, and, and with some businesses. I think, though, to sum this up with the, with the, in the introduction, is that generally data breach is a terrible situation to be in and something we, we don't want to inflict on others, right? So fundamentally where we are today, folks, is that identity and access management is the holy grail of moving towards a zero-trust environment. And I think what 
the organizations that are out there need to understand is that zero trust is kind of an IT thing. It's not really something that you're going to um, really kind of like uh, uh, advocate for at the highest levels of the organization. It's more of a philosophy of where do we start in this in this journey. So if we go to the next slide, what we can see here is an understanding of the relationships between identity and access management and the inside sort of story that we need to keep tracking um, in terms of like our, our, our engagement with the business to try and find out where the sweet spot is. Now, how this breaks down into um, the kind of three phases of zero trust is Visibility, automation, and orchestration. Without visibility, right, we are into the weeds. Visibility is the fundamental layer that we should focus on when we are considering identity and access management specifically. So, um, Gladys, are we good? Are we good here? Is everyone digging this? Yeah. Yeah. Just, okay. I'll push Perfect. the slides All for right. you, Ian. Don't worry about it. Oh, this is the magic bless. of live, <laughs> live summits, everyone. We're doing it live. I, you know what? This is a central part of what I'm going to talk about a little bit later on, which is team workflows. Now, visibility and automation and orchestration. There are three phases here that are key to even getting anywhere close to the I'm going to say the promised land, if you will, in cybersecurity. So we know we have problems across the board when we talk about identity and endpoint behavior and the data mess that everyone is faced with and apps and infrastructure and networks. Now, where I'm coming from with um, a lot of the folks is identity and access management in the perfect world has multi-factor authentication against everything plus single sign-on for all the things. Now, realistically, folks, this doesn't happen. We all have those, those issues. Now, I was actually in Denver at the Pax 8 show and talking to some folks that were working in a financial institution, and they have AS400 and WebSphere front end, WebSphere being the front end, AS400 being the back end, and of course, that doesn't really integrate with modern Active Directory without a very huge expense, as well as people that can, you know, fundamentally re-engineer the company. We have an identity and access management crisis. Now, the bad guys know about this. So this is why we see the effectiveness of cyber attacks that focus on things like brute force and password spraying and all of these other ways that the bad guys are trying to get into your particular network. Now, this has not helped a lot by some of the appliances that we have in place that will give credentials. That's not a good thing, to be fair. Now, when we think about where we need to go with, especially with uh, the identity and access management people, is we need to find a way and, and Fundamentally, this is kind of like an, a, a huge issue with organizations that we've seen play out time and time again in cyber attacks is that we need to absolutely focus on the ability to link a human resources system or enterprise resource planning system into Windows Active Directory. This is a huge ask, okay? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. This is a huge ask of IT departments and of security departments to work with the human resources element within your organization to provision users properly based on their roles, based on their, um, based on the criteria that their manager has said that they need in terms of access. This is where the maturity is and what is fundamentally the stumbling block here is that we look at identity and access management as a IT problem. It's not. It's an actual communications and engagement problem with the organization. Now, you can see here where I've laid out, and, and this comes directly from Microsoft folks. This is like literally a cut and paste 
of what they're talking about here is like the ability that when a new person joins the organization and they're added into the HR system, that kicks off a whole bunch of scripts. This is the zero trust part of IDAM where you have automa uh, uh, automation and orchestration to build the actual profile that that individual needs having just joined the company. Now this this is an ins this can be an insurmountable issue with the organization because the biggest silo that we that we are faced with in IT is not understanding who's actually working for us, which is amazing. And and this actually drives out a whole bunch of actual bad practices within the industry, right? To to going back to manual methods. Right, manual methods, which you know, basically, are are subject to issues and problems, and and what have you, right? So we're in a situation where you know we we can connect the HR system to the Azure AD user provisioning service, right? So Gladys, we should be on slide 12 right now, where I talk about simple, basic HR scenarios. Is that what people are yes. seeing? Yes, Brilliant. That's exactly oh, where we're at. This, is, this actually might be working, folks. Anyways, when we deal with the new employee hiring, employ, uh, changes in that employee, you know, everybody gets promotions. Hopefully we don't talk about demotions, but um, everybody gets promotions, employee terminations, and employee rehires, which to be fair actually happens, I, I would say, fairly rarely. But these are use cases that have to be accounted for when you're dealing with um, identity and access management within your organization. The single source of truth in the organization is who's getting a paycheck. And that paycheck is dependent upon their role and their position within, within the organization. And this is why, you know, folks, I'm going to plead and beg with you to Sit with HR and figure out who these people are, what roles they're being hired for, and what are their IT requirements. This requires a person with personality, a person that can engage with the HR, you know, vice president or manager or head of, to have a constructive dialogue about figuring out what the access that these particular individuals that are being hired in particular roles are required. If you're not doing that, it is really difficult for IT to provide services. Now, we have come a long way, baby, okay? We have come a long way, baby, from the days of, you know, oh, you just need to give this person the same credentials and access that Iris has. That's no longer uh, a thing. We can't do that anymore because what inevitably happens is that person is either overprivileged in terms of, and the IT department doesn't know about it or they you know are underprivileged and they're opening up a ton of service tickets to figure out exactly what they need so we really really need to lock that down now I want to talk about this in terms of like how identity and access management feeds the entire zero trust initiative that you have going on in, in, in your organization. Now, obviously, a member of your organization shouldn't be able to log in or should be able to log in to an endpoint. If they, if they can't log into an endpoint, then that requires a service ticket and an elevation, uh, you know, to figure out why that is. But generally, what we don't want to have is a situation where a non-authorized user can log into an endpoint. Now, this is a real challenge because when we're talking about SaaS infrastructure, we're talking about passing single sign-on information back to a third party in order to authorize the access. Now, if we are not good and diligent about withdrawing that access, we end up in a situation where a person that has now been terminated from your organization still has access to a bunch of SaaS applications because we didn't enable SSO. This is a really clouded and murky area when it comes to the actual endpoints for your company. And this is something that we need to really, really understand in terms of the use cases, especially when we're talking about 
third-party services, and, of course, you know, uh, contractors and whatnot. Now, I put up a bunch of arrows here and stuff like that. We are in a data problem like you wouldn't believe, okay? And, and to be honest, this is something because of the legacy of IT that we are struggling with on a daily basis. Where we are right now is we, we, we don't really know where the data is. Like, yeah, let's be fair. We have SaaS um, I, applications within our organization, and people are downloading data to their endpoints. They're not sharing it on a share drive or into SharePoint or things like that. So, so we can generally agree that endpoints are going to have business-sensitive data. Right, fair enough. We have apps within our own organization where their data is generally thought to reside in the infrastructure, but because of SharePoint and because of other sharing tools and collaboration tools, the data is everywhere. And the data, especially when the situation with Teams and SharePoint isn't particularly locked down, that data can end up being shared. That data may have links to privileged information and there you go. So, so our biggest struggle right now is data. And let me tell you a little bit of a story here where, you know, folks have gone in, they've done an analysis of their data, their unstructured data, they've gone through, looked at the permissions and stuff like that, and there has been a lot of situations at the enterprise level where data has been orphaned and that there is no actual possible way for anyone that is currently residing at the company to access that particular data. It's orphaned. Conversely, we have data that may be sensitive that is available to people that potentially could be unauthorized. So we have kind of a nightmare when it comes to the actual data, and this is all related back to identity and access management in the in the ideas that if there are, if the journey includes visibility, automation, and orchestration, that data can be accessed by unauthorized parties or parties that are within your organization and maybe even under, you know, like the confidentiality clauses of that particular organization. But if they have access to data that they shouldn't, it is a risk in the organization. So, the thing that I need to kind of link back to identity and zero trust is the application stack. Now, we kind of have a couple of different sort of scenarios that play out. We have internal applications that are only internally accessed by the organization. Cool. That actually is the easiest scenario. But when we have applications that are customer facing, that can be accessed from anywhere on the internet, or that are also accessed with extra privileges by logging in as a member of the particular company, we have a major identity and access management problem. We can't even get near zero trust if we don't know and don't have a way of controlling the credentials or access for applications that are either staff or in-house that have been built for the organization. This all comes down to the um, software development lifecycle process. And I know, folks, this is a bit of, uh, of sort of a journey, but hear me out on this. Identity and access management really equals accountability. SDLC processes require identity. We can't have generic user ID. Everyone that is in this industry since the 1980s and the 1990s knows the danger of generic user IDs. And, and service accounts that aren't properly protected. So where we are right now, when we start talking about and having a conversation about apps, either in-house development or third parties, it's really about controlling that access, getting that, at that audit information, and being able to know what the truth is and who did what when. That becomes a huge, a huge issue within the organization. Okay. Now, this slide that talks about infrastructure, and Gladys, can I just check in with you? Everybody's looking at infrastructure with the two arrows? Yes, they sure are. Oh, fantastic. Okay. So, folks, infrastructure is where the battle is occurring. Now, 
identity and access management is all about getting access to systems and doing the work that the business needs to create. Infrastructure has the biggest issue. So they have two issues. One is privileged access management. So when you're making a change, when you're able to access all the things within your organization, those accounts are, you know, the goal. Those accounts are exactly what the threat actors are after, right? So we end up in a position where the conversation right now is about how is the infrastructure protected? And I bring up the, the I'm, I'm going to say, I bring up the specter, the guy with the tickle, which is the VPN access that you're using for your infrastructure and the security of that particular infrastructure. Infrastructure is specific with holds your apps and your data, and really, to be fair, endpoints are really defined as the infrastructure as well. That infrastructure is the battleground because that's actually what the bad guys want. Sure, they can compromise a set of credentials, gain access to an endpoint, perhaps even access your data, but to do real damage to your organization, it's the infrastructure that can present the biggest threat to your team. This is why when I talk about zero trust and I talk about security and I talk about the unification process that we're, that we're going through. Now, let me back that up because I said a word that I really need to provide some definition around. Unification, in my view, is where an organization, IT, governance and risk, security, uh, you know, the help desk, even the outsourced partners when it comes to, like, your vendors that are providing security are all part of the security mission that your company is on. So when, when I talk about, you know, sort of like the three phases of IT security, so the first one was really watching what was going on, right? and then intervening when there was something that looked insecure. Fair enough. Then it was like moving into what I'm gonna call the convergence stage, where IT and IT security were aligned and they were preventing very bad things from happening to the organization. That worked for a lot of organizations. And I, I feel like if the organization has advanced and has done some cloud stuff, has done some digital transformation, that's generally where they're at. But then Microsoft came along and blew up the whole thing when it came to infrastructure, especially with Azure and Azure Cloud. What they blew up was the idea that security and IT and governance and risk were somehow not, you know, all on the same page. So when we talk about infrastructure and when we really, like, look deep into the infrastructure of modern businesses, we're finding is it's made up of the stuff they, they own, the stuff that they buy from someone else, and it all comes back to understanding the basics of where the data and applications for that business are, are being delivered from. Now, I'm spending a little bit of extra time on this because this is directly related to privilege and access management as well as identity, which are, are huge challenges in the industry moving forward because let's face it things got a lot more complex now there is a need to trust the internet service provider and this directly relates to the infrastructure which directly relates to all the other things that i've been talking about but the bottom line here is is that this is the alum this is the end of where the responsibility of the business is versus the actual internet service provider now don't get me wrong, when you talk about networks, you can introduce things that make the network a little bit safer, right? We, we can talk about all the different things that we can do with email, like DMARC and DKMI and, uh, and you know, SPF and all of those types of things. Ultimately, though, your ISP and the relationships that you have with ISP are part of your extended perimeter, if you will, in terms of filtering attacks on the infrastructure. Right, And a lot of those infrastructure attacks are looking for privileged accounts that gain access to all of this because when those accounts are, uh, I'm going to say, compromised, 
apps, data, endpoints, and identity are all part now of that equation. This is why we see these constant cyber attacks. Move it is a great example of how it's basically an infrastructure solution that was put in place that then gives access to all of the infrastructure of a particular company, right, going all the way up into identity. So I can't stress enough that if you're thinking about identity and access management, it's all about making sure that that privileged access to the infrastructure level of your organization is absolutely ironclad and intact. And this comes down to the issue that we have with data, right? The less data your organization has, and the less risk you have. So when I advise businesses that are saying, hey, let's, I'm thinking about looking at our IT through a different lens. I'm going to look at zero trust. What are we actually talking about? Let's start with identity and access management for that visibility, automation, and orchestration across all aspects of the actual business, right? And let's ensure that we, even if we have to run a test pilot against one particular brand of your organization, let's ensure that we're actually moving forward and our program encounters, you know, identity and access management challenges across everything from employees, mergers and acquisitions, divestitures, but also contractors and third-party vendors, right? So in this diagram, the, the key takeaway from my presentation today is, listen, let's assume that we have a level of trust with our network providers that give access to the infrastructure. That's the first set of cyber attacks that, that you know, we're really faced with when we see, you know, Barracuda, ESG, and a whole bunch of other things coming under attack that are like yielding up. That, that includes you in my audience that are running privileged um, access via Microsoft um, Outlook um, based on on-premise exchange servers. This is a terrible idea. But if we look at it from the other direction where we don't have a firm grip on our identity and we're not doing user management correctly, that gives direct access to the endpoints. And we find this with the brute force type of attacks that we're seeing, endpoint compromisation, credential grabbing in terms of phishing and email. So when we look at the two spectrums of cyber attacks right now, it really falls into two categories. One is credential grabbing to give access to particular endpoints and escalation from there. And then the other side at the other end of the spectrum is attempting to infiltrate an organization through an exposed vulnerability that gives access to the infrastructure. Right. So we're coming down to the, to, to the bitter end here. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about visibility and visibility only, right? The, the efforts that we need to put into our organization is really huge when you're talking about a fundamental shift in how we approach cybersecurity from the very beginning of cybersecurity. Right? This involves, and as you can see, I've listed out all the parts of your organization that need to be engaged in order to make things clear, in order to make things safe. So we're talking about GRC, we're talking about the Project Management Office, we're talking about the Cyber Threat Intelligence Team, um, we're talking about the DevOps Team, NOC, SOC, all of those different things. They all need to be engaged. I'm not going to go through all these points because we're going to get to your questions uh, very shortly. But I think what fundamentally is really important here is that a policy has to drive this. We're into the realm right now where if we don't have a policy that's guiding us on zero trust visibility, which includes the identity and access management piece, where we are is that we're never going to progress. This needs buy-in from the top, from the top people in the organization, and also needs a trusted vendor engagement with vendors in order to provide the type of tools that you need in order to achieve the best results for your organization. And I think the last point that I have here is is really the most resonant one: is that asking who, what, where, when, why, and how when it comes to the people and systems that we need in terms of access and identity management is really the key to kicking off the whole discussion. I love Wiley Coyote because I think 
you know, he brings it out with his with his catapult. You're you're trying to move at an IT level, and this and this fundamentally is probably one of the most difficult processes that you'll undertake as a leader, as a senior leader um, in your organization. Understanding where your risks and vulnerabilities are, adopting a zero trust framework, starting with identity and asset management, is a huge ask. There are many organizations that aren't even ready to have that conversation. Now, I call it T3Ps, tech, tactics, training, and procedures. Some people call it TTP. But I want to go through these, um, you know, kind of line by line for a moment here, because we're going to we're going to have uh, some time for your questions. But the important thing here is to protect that infrastructure asset. So that comes down to content delivery network and web application firewall protection, which even Microsoft has recently dropped the ball as they suffered and had impactful. Um, cyber attacks from anonymous Sudan, who can be described as a bunch of hackers with a um, data tethering plan um, that have managed to get a botnet to do a bunch of types of exhaustion attacks on Microsoft's infrastructure. A bit embarrassing, I will say. But, but fundamentally, where we are right now in terms of like protecting our assets, protecting our APIs, especially from those type of attacks, really comes down to your architecture team and working and understanding and building threat models that are relevant to your organization. That's absolutely critical. Now, the other part of this is detecting what the heck is going on. So security information event management scheme and load balancer configurations are absolutely critical to protecting those assets that you have as well as on the infrastructure level that will entertain a potential login of a privileged account from a country that should never be accessing your infrastructure to begin with. So when I when I talk about identity and asset management, it does really bring together the whole fundamental view of the organization's IT and uh, uh, infrastructure. And this is what is so mind-blowing to me is that even though we've had experience with DDoS, we've had experience with brute force, we've had experience with password spray, these attacks still to this day lead to compromise. This is an absolute critical aspect to focus on because ultimately if you prevent you know, someone in Latvia from signing in as the CEO of your company because you have a like, geo blocking enabled on their email or on their VPN access, you are protecting that identity and access management piece and doing a great job of it because the best cyber attack is the one that you could avoid by having actual great rules in place. Now, I'm going to go through a few of these right now because I think it's really important that you see the whole board game that I'm trying to play right now with you. Multi-factor access controls, right? We're like down into the 40-minute mark of the uh, uh, of the presentation, and I'm now mentioning multi-factor for the first time. Uh, folks, this is should be a the default setting for customers. It should be the default setting for all of your employees. Now, employees are really easy to manage when it comes to MFA, right? You just say it's a policy, this is what we do, and uh, the discussion is good. Now, this is especially important for my devs that are out there in the audience for repos and signing key management. No question about it. But let's talk a little bit about the customer experience and the issue that we're faced with when, um, you know, the IT security team makes demands it seems to potentially be interpreted as impacting the quick adoption of whatever it is that you're offering online. This is a huge battle, by the way. And, and as a security team member who has been involved in that battle, I will give you my words of wisdom and advice. The first thing that you need to do is understand that the trial version of whatever software that you're offering is a trial version. So you can be super quick to adoption. You can uh, delete all the security. There is no security. No one cares. All right. Now, as soon as that customer has uploaded sensitive data or 
is a, a or, or is a active user of that particular application that you've put out online, that's where you start trying to incentivize them to use multi-factor uh, multi-factor authentication. Now, this is a way of sort of like understanding. Now, you might need Google Analytics. You might need some plugins to actually determine what those active users are and what data they've uploaded to your platform. All cool, but that is not an insurmountable technical issue. From the security perspective, what we want is the folks that are paying us money that have uploaded sensitive data, we want them protected. It doesn't actually matter if they're in trial, but if their trial is successful and we can start charging them money, we need to incentivize them to do MSA. One of the most powerful ways of getting people to do multi-factor authentication is to give them a small discount, give them a little bonus, give them a stuffed animal. It doesn't matter. But the point here is from a security perspective and from a governance perspective, getting your customers to adopt multi-factor authentication, far easier in Europe than it is in North America, I would say. Um, this is the way. You know, if you're a fan of the Mandalorian, you know, you should be saying that. Absolutely. Now, let's go one step further back into the actual application development lifecycle when we talk about software bill of materials, integrity, monitoring, and voluntary scanning. All of this is active stuff that you need to do in order to prevent organizations from exposing credentials. Your, your exposure is the hacker's opportunity. So I think it's, it's really important here to understand that the SBOM, the integrity monitoring, and the vulnerability scanning is all part of the plan to protect those identities. And these are customers or folks that have access to the platform that you're on. Now, securing the development environment as you would production, 100%. Let's not put the critical data that we have in a development environment without the level of protections that we have in the production. That's just a very bad idea. And that's why you know I followed up with the eliminate or reduce production data and develop an environment. How this ties back to identity and access management is really about making sure that your customer data has the least exposure within your organization, right? Because if you're using customer data in a development environment and maybe that's outsourced to another country, well, first of all, in the UK, you might be breaking some laws, some actual regulatory laws. But in the United States, you might be in a situation where you're using development environment as a sort of like a backup of the production environment, and that ain't cool because the security level that you have for the development environment where all your developers have, you know, local administrative or even domain level administrative credentials are like the one shot in terms of the bad guys getting access to that customer data. And nothing will kill you faster in California than letting customer data become unleashed uh, on the Internet. You know, we don't even have to talk about brand damage. What we have to actually talk about is organizational level damage. And, you know, the last thing a senior developer really needs to do is explain how they keep using a data dump of the production environment to do their updates and testing on, and that isn't nearly as well protected, uh, you know, with multi-factor authentication and, you know, GOIG blocking and stuff like that as the actual production environment is. So that's super important. And I think, you know, the last thing that I can say that relates to identity and access management is really around the disaster recovery and business continuity plan. This has to be able to be consumed and used by the organization. So if senior accounts that have access to these documents, to these processes, to maybe even some of the scripts you use to rebuild your organization are compromised, well, that's the ballgame, folks. And if you're in that particular position and those in, that information has been compromised, then the actual recovery from a, from a cyber incident which involves unauthorized access to your infrastructure, well, that's the ballgame, right? So we really need to focus on the fact that those credentials 
that could be compromised uh, could lead to a full-scale cyber attack, which the bad guys get dwell time, they get access, they get privileged access to your organization, and can really kick the knees out of your organization. So this is why, you know, the focus, you know, when we talk about zero trust, we talk about guarding those identity and access management credentials, it becomes a, a, a real call to action, a real imperative to make sure because the access that those things grant can be really leveraged by a hostile um, actor. And finally, issues around virtual private networking and MPLS and um, the various protocols that we're using, we need to focus on this because they are the slippery slope that end up driving uh, the cyber criminals to get access into your systems, either with a, a, a set of credentials or even because of exposed services that can be compromised and that end up yielding a bunch of valid credentials from your organization. This is what we have to fix. So I know I've said an awful lot to you folks out there, but we have about 10 minutes or so that we can, maybe 12 minutes or so, where we can get some questions. And, um, and I'm hoping that, you know, I can, I can help you with some of the answers. Great stuff, Ian. Thank you so much for that super informative presentation. We have a bunch of audience questions, so we're just going to get right to it. And I'm going to start with Abby, who has a conundrum for you, Ian. Abby says, our company is made up of five different domains with trust in place and some complicated integrations. It seems nearly impossible to manage identities like you are suggesting without massive consolidation. That is an absolutely great question. Now, one of the biggest problems with franking companies, as I like to call them, where they're like made up of different different companies, and then they push on you a shared services model. So the first fundamental part is to make sure that the IT and IT security team have that bi-directional trust within the organization so that you have access to you know, the top-level domain capabilities of that company and the top-level domain of you know, whatever the parent company is. This has to be a relationship of trust. You might be dealing with an IT manager or whatnot. What you need to do is bring everybody to the table and say, here is the security policy that defines how everybody in this franking company needs to adapt to the situation on the ground. So one of the things that you can do is actually, it's not even an IT problem, it's sort of a business problem, and say, okay, if we decided that there's like fundamental policies with regards to like, you know, endpoint configuration or even user IDs and passwords, that is the building block. And you just need to keep rolling that out and be able to provide. Now, you can manage this project across multiple domains. That's not a particular issue. But what you need to do is assert a little bit of your authority on saying, listen, no, we're the parent company. We tell you what you need to, per what you do. And you, do, you don't do that as like an IT guy in a very you know, confrontational way. You push that up to your senior vice president or the vice president of vice presidents in your organization. And you tell them, listen, like, I got to bring these people on board. I got to bring them into the compliance of our corporate policies at the governance level and be able to get reports and be able to get data that supports the fact that we're doing a good job. So you make the conversation. And, and you know what? My heart goes out to these people that are in these situations because you make the conversation about how can we get aligned? How can we build forward? How can I support you? But the first piece of this is really about the transparency and really understanding that, you know what, we're all supposed to be working together and swimming in the, in the same lane. And I'll say it's a hearts and minds issue, right? It's really about your ability to communicate the importance of what the corporate governance structure is demanding and make it easy, make it engaging, make it funny, but getting a consensus that this is the direction of travel and you know, you're sorry that there are some things that we can't fix, but we, we do need to start aligning to the corporate policies. 
that's what it comes down to. Okay. We have a couple of VPN questions, all right? So first we're gonna start with Justin. He says, we are caught in a hard place. We manage VPN access via the network team and it's not integrated with AD. Are we failing a basic requirement for SSO? And what do you recommend getting this under control? So listen, ever since we saw Fortinet, um, Cisco, um, SonicWall, we all saw vulnerabilities that ended up presenting credentials that had been created in the actual device. And in some cases, privileged credentials in those particular devices with the exploit, it basically gave a valid set of credentials via VPN. Now you've got two roads. The first is you know, replace the VPN with something that has SSO because then you have control of the IGAM in your organization, right? Or you make sure that you're doing audits and you're making sure that um, the, you have a rule based access controls in place for those authenticated users in your organization and that the actual credentials that you use to access the VPN are different from the Active Directory credentials that you have. If you take Active Directory credentials and you manually are inputting them into your firewall, it's game over. You're going to get old because if the vulnerability of firewall presents itself to the point where it vomits up the credentials for access, well, then you just, you know, we're, at that point, Gladys, the only way to describe it is we're running the table, <laughs> right? <laughs> we're, we're putting all the balls into all the pockets um, and nobody else gets to shoot. So I think it's really important that, again, policy drives this, but also common sense. Like, what the hell, man? You know, if you're, if you're trying to do this uh, manually for an enterprise organization, you're really hanging yourself out to, to get on. So, you know, people have to wake up. And, and one last piece. I don't, I don't necessarily land a lot of blame on those particular providers and stuff like that. But when they tell you to upgrade your stuff, please, for the love of God, upgrade to the latest <laughs> operating systems. Make sure you're using a licensed product so you have access to those upgrades. Because that in itself is super important when you're dealing with anything that can yield a valid set of credentials for your organization. If there's one thing I can, be, I can be passionate about, it's the fact that if there's any way that you can prevent the exposure of your credentials, you have to take that action. <laughs> Great. Uh, we're going to squeeze in one last question. This one's from Greg, who tells you, Ian, I'm sorry, that you I think you're, you have dropped off a little bit. Sorry, Ian, can you hear me now? Oh. Uh-oh, Ian? Oh, good. <laughs> Ian. <laughs> All right, you know what? Hello? Yeah. Hey, Ian, I got one last question for you, if you can hear me. If okay. Not, if yeah, I can. Yeah, not All right. Greg says, uh, and chastises you that you conveniently left out the Microsoft and other software licensing provisioning, which is a challenge for IDAM. Can you comment on what you see as the best approach? Okay, this is a, this is a huge issue. It's a silo that IT and um, cybersecurity are really struggling with. You're absolutely right. Proper licensing of software is absolutely critical. And it's a, it's a dark horse. It's a thing that nobody wants to talk about in the organization. And it really is a problem when, you know, you have uh, applications like Adobe that require a SaaS login in order to work, but also an annual licensing or a monthly licensing uh, subscription as you go. The conversation has to involve the business. It has to involve the IT delivery elements and it has to involve security. Because ultimately, what we need to make sure is that like, when people are using online applications, that inadvertent, accidental exposure of confidential information doesn't happen. Everybody loves using Slido, but no one realized that a lot of the presentations that they made ended up being public. And I think that's a huge issue, that the organization has to have policies 
And then they also have to have some audit controls around. And it's just really, to me, it's like an education issue. It's like reach out to your people, talk about this, make sure HR is engaged so that everyone knows what the rules of the road are and that they shouldn't just sort of like randomly start using this new SaaS application called TikTok and all of a sudden exposing, you know, confidential information of their organization because, you know, they they think they're doing the right thing. Like, most people aren't malicious. And I think that's the other issue here, too, is that people are just going to be people. They're going to work. They're going to work. And they, they honestly want to do the best of what they think is for the company. So, you know, just have that dialogue and that, have that conversation and, and not, you know, scalp hunt somebody did something terrible online. But let's treat it as a learning experience really focus on what is best for the company and if you don't know what's best for the company then maybe just ask your manager or ask your director can i do this should i do this is this in the best interest in the company yeah perfect that's a great note to end it on ian thank you so much again for a great presentation and enjoy the enjoy the conference that you're at thank you so much i love you guys and i look forward to the next one Thanks, Ian. Everyone else, stay tuned. We're going to take a very, very quick break, and we'll be back at the top of the hour for the second session of the day. It's a good one, Identity and Access Management Best Practices in 2023. This one's going to be featuring another frequent speaker of ours, Brian Posey, and moderated by Woo! my colleague, Brian John Manners. <laughs> take a quick time in the meantime to check out those resources on your console provided by Zoho and Tools Forever, and we'll be right back. Hi everyone, welcome to the second session of the Identity and Access Management for Windows Enterprise Summit, organized by the hardworking folks at Redmond Magazine who have brought together some of the very best independent experts on today's topic. Uh, many thanks to our sponsors, Zoho, provider of unified cloud software designed to help enterprises break down silos between departments and increase organizational efficiency, and Tools Forever, provider of user provisioning and governance software for commercial and educational institutions for making this event possible. And thanks to you for joining us. I'm John K. Waters, Editor-in-Chief in the Converge 360 Group of 1105 Media, and I'll be your moderator uh, for the second of three information-packed sessions. Before we get going here, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, offer a couple of reminders here. Each of today's sessions is being recorded for later access. Keep an eye out for an email with a link to that recording. It'll be coming your way in the next few days. Each of today's sessions will be followed by a five to 10 minute Q&A. You can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Please feel free to add your questions as they occur to you throughout the summit. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Our sponsors uh, have provided some extra resources that can be found on your console. Please take a moment to check those out. At the end of the summit, uh, you'll be asked to take a, a short survey. We know you guys are busy, uh, but we're hoping you'll take a moment to give us uh, some honest feedback about today's event. And last but not least, at the end of the third session, one lucky attendee will be receiving an Una pizza oven from wood-fired flavor to gas, gas-powered consistency and electrified convenience. This portable oven works in the kitchen, the backyard, and beyond. But you got to stick with us to win it, so uh, stay with us to the end. All right, now let's get started with our second session, Identity and Access Management pra Best Practices in, the, in uh, 2023. And for this session, we've called on scientist, author, and 21-time Microsoft MVP, Brian Posey. Brian has written thousands of articles uh, about information technology and contributed to dozens of books and video training courses on a huge variety of IT topics. Among other professional roles, Brian served as the lead network engineer for the United States Department of Defense at Fort Knox and the head of the technology and engineering group for the Association of Space Flight Professionals. He writes the popular Posey's Tips and Tricks column for Redmond Magazine as well as the must-read Posey's Moonshot column, through which he shares his commercial astronaut training experiences. I know you're in for a great session, folks. Take it away, Brian. Hey, thank you so much, John, and hello, greetings, and welcome, everyone. 
So today we're going to be talking all about some best practices for IAM in 2023. Now, before we get going, I got to be honest with you. I do a lot of these best practices types talks, and typically they're fairly straightforward. Um, if I'm asked to speak on a certain subject, I might look up, there might be five to ten best practices that I can talk about, and I'll build a webcast around that. This has not at all been the case uh, with regard to IAM best practices. And the reason for that is that everybody seems to have their own unique ideas about what best practices entail. Each, each IAM provider has their own list of best practices. And yes, there is some overlap from one provider to another, but sometimes you may also find that some of these best practices are contradictory in nature too. And on top of the IAM providers, you also have various organizations that provide their own list of best practices. Uh, on this slide, you can see the sources that I used in pulling together the information in this presentation. So I've got best practices from Amazon, from Microsoft, and from the U.S. government. But these are, this is by no means a comprehensive list. There are many, many other lists of best practices out there. As a matter of fact, even though I designed this to be a really jam-packed session, I'm using maybe 10% of the best practices that I found. There are many, many more that I just simply couldn't get to for time reasons. So with that said, let's go ahead and get into it. Now, it should come as no surprise to anybody that IAM is a prized target for attackers. Uh, the idea behind this is really simple. If an attacker can own your identity system, they own you. Pure and simple, game over at that point. So it's extremely important to protect your IAM system against all of the pervasive threats that are out there. And when it comes to threat mitigation, which is really what these best practices are all about, the threat mitigation techniques generally fall into five categories. And that previous slide that I showed you with all of the various sources, um, this slide right here, the very last link on there to media.defense.gov, that's where this list of five categories came from. So I would certainly encourage you to delve into those in more detail later on. At any rate, the five categories are identity governance, environmental hardening, identity federation and single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, and IAM monitoring and auditing. So there are best practices that are associated with each one of those individual categories. And I'm going to delve into each one of these a little bit. Certainly this isn't going to be a deep dive, but I'm going to try to give you as many best practices in these categories as I can in the time that we've got. Starting with identity governance. Now identity governance is one of those things that, as I mentioned, everybody seems to have their own idea about. Uh, different providers define identity governance in different ways. I tend to think of identity governance as a collection of policies pertaining to the way that identities in your IEM system are handled. Uh, for example, policies regarding what needs to happen when an account gets created, what needs to happen when an account gets deleted, uh, what happens when you need to assign an account to a group, things like that. Now, when it comes to identity governance, as a best practice, I would recommend using orchestration or automation, as it's often referred to, wherever possible. Because whenever you can use orchestration, that's going to make sure that these um, identity governance events happen in a very consistent and prescribed manner. So for example, let's suppose that you've got uh, 10 new employees who are coming into your company and you need to onboard those employees. Could you do it manually? Of course, absolutely. Uh, that's the way that it used to be done in the old days, no problem at all. But by automating that routine, you do a couple of different things. One, you take human error out of the equation. So you don't have to worry about somebody ending up with permissions that they shouldn't or not having the permissions that they need or something else going awry. The other thing that you do is because you're doing everything in a uniform manner, you're making anything that's different stand out. So if an attacker were to try to compromise your system and they were to go in and start manually creating accounts, well, they're probably not going to be using your orchestration system to do that. Um, so those manual account creation events should stand out to you. Now, even though orchestration is highly beneficial and it's something that I certainly recommend doing if you're able to, it's certainly not a, a required component of identity governance. The important thing here is to make sure that you've got policies in place regarding the way that your identities are being handled. So one of the things that I want to be sure and point out about identity governance is that identity governance and zero trust really go hand in hand, even though they're not the same thing. And one of the key components behind zero trust is to adopt least privilege access. Uh, least privilege access, for anybody out there who might not be familiar with the term, 
generally refers to making sure that users have the bare minimum privileges that they need in order to do their jobs and nothing else. Now, least privilege access isn't zero trust by itself, but it's certainly a core component of zero trust. Uh, the zero trust philosophy is built largely on the idea of least privilege access. So why least privilege access? Well, it helps to mitigate a lot of the more prevalent threats that are out there against your identity system. So for example, phishing and social engineering are some of the biggest threats that users face every single day. Uh, I don't know about you, but I couldn't even begin to tell you how many phishing messages I get over the course of a week. So this is a very persistent threat against all of your end users. So applying the principles of least privilege access, that's not going to stop those phishing attacks. It, it's not going to do a thing to bring those to a halt. But what it will do for you is to limit the damage if a user were to fall for one of these phishing attacks. So if a user were to click on something that they shouldn't and it unleashes a ransomware infection or something like that, well, that ransomware is not going to be able to touch anything that the user who unleashed the ransomware attack doesn't have access to. So it's going to limit the blast radius. And it also does the same thing for you for insider threats. So if, for example, you've got a rogue user who decides that they want to take down the company for whatever reason, well, they're only going to be able to affect those resources that they have permission to access. So least privilege access is a super important part of identity best practices. Now, when we talk about least privileged access, there's a very natural tendency to focus on end user accounts because I've often referred to end users as being the weakest link in the security chain. And that's not to say that end users are bad or that they're doing things on purpose or anything, just a lot of end users haven't been educated on security. So many times they might simply just not know any better than to click on that link or whatever, and that's a real problem for your organization. So I do tend to think of users as the weakest link in the security chain. But having said that, it's also extremely important to apply the principles of least privilege access to privileged accounts. So those are your administrative accounts that you're using to perform privileged operations within your organization. So just a few quick random best practices regarding least privileged access for privileged accounts. Uh, one of the things that you should do is to use RBAC, or role-based access control, uh, to segregate administrative duties. So rather than having you know, one administrative account that has permission to do everything like was so commonly done way back when, uh, instead designate separate accounts for um, separate administrative tasks. Uh, another thing is to take advantage of just-in-time administration. Now for anybody who's not familiar with the concept of just-in-time administration, there are various flavors of it out there and each one has its own unique nuances. But the basic idea is that you've got a privileged account but that privileged account doesn't necessarily have privileges associated with it. I, I know that sounds weird and contradictory, but that's the gist of it. So if, for example, an administrator needs to set up some new users, what they do is they go in and they request the privilege to do that. And then the system will say, okay, I'll give you those privileges, but those privileges are only going to be valid for 15 minutes. So then the, the administrator has 15 minutes to set up those new user accounts, at which time those privileges are taken away. So the idea behind that is that if that administrative account were to be compromised somehow, well, then the attacker isn't going to be able to do anything with that account because there are no privileges associated with it. Uh, next best practice on the list, policies should prohibit privileged accounts from being used for non-privileged operations. That's just kind of a fancy way of saying that if someone is logged in with a privileged account, they should only be using that account for the purposes that it was intended for. Um, the user or the privileged user should be using a standard account for things like browsing the web or checking their email or all the more mundane day-to-day -day things that everybody does. And then finally, on the last one on the list is break glass accounts should never be used except in dire emergencies. A break glass account is one of those things that I highly recommend having, and Microsoft actually recommends that you have a minimum of two break glass accounts. So what these are is an all-powerful administrative account that has access to absolutely everything. Now, certainly there are risks that are associated with having such an account, but the idea is that that account should only be used in a situation where you have no other way to recover. In the meantime, you, after that account is created, you give it a super long and complicated password, you print out that password, lock it in a vault somewhere where nobody can get to it, and then just forget that account even exists, aside from normal auditing and monitoring of the account, um, and never use that account unless you have no other choice.
So the next, next best practice is to treat identity as the, perim, as the primary security perimeter. So the basic idea is that at one time, generally all IT security focused on perimeter defenses. Uh, the idea being that the vast majority of your resources were confined to four walls. Users went into the office every day. They worked from domain-joined corporate desktops. They accessed servers that were located in the organization's data center. And so everything was located right there. So if you manage to keep the bad guys out and you keep any critical data from leaving your organization, well, then you were doing a good job. But this particular model has been obsolete for quite a few years. It just doesn't work well in the modern world because, for one thing, you have users who are working remotely. There's also bring your own device. So you can't assume that users are going to be working from carefully curated domain-joined corporate desktops. They might be working from their phone or from any other personal device that you can imagine. And, of course, there's also the cloud. Your workloads aren't confined to the data center, nor have they been in quite some time. So perimeter defenses really don't make any sense in the modern world. Now, that's not to say that it's not important to protect your network perimeter if you still have one. Uh, you absolutely should. But you shouldn't focus primarily on perimeter uh, defenses. Instead, treat identity as the new perimeter. And one of the advantages to doing that is that when you treat identity as the modern perimeter, you're really helping to lay the groundwork for zero trust. And if you really stop and think about this, uh, the perimeter approach really violates the basic concept of zero trust. Because the basic concept behind zero trust is that nothing on your network should be considered trustworthy until proven otherwise. But when you focus on um, perimeter-based defenses, you're making the assumption that anything inside of your network perimeter is trustworthy. And that just really doesn't jive with a um, zero trust world. So focus on protecting your identities a lot more than you're focusing on protecting any perimeter that may still exist. So the next best practice is to enable password hash synchronization for on-premises users, and that's if you're using Azure Active Directory. Um, this is one of those best practices that really only pertains to Microsoft environments. But I wanted to go ahead and include it because it does a couple of things for you. First of all, it makes things easier on your users uh, because you're going to probably end up with fewer account lockouts by doing this. Um, here's what can happen. Let's suppose for a moment that you've got a user who's working in the office and they're connected to a domain joined uh, corporate desktop. They've got an Active Directory uh, account that's synchronized to an Azure AD account, and they change their password. So later on, they go home and they've got a laptop that has cache credentials but the laptop hasn't connected to the corporate network, so it's unaware of that password change. The user goes to sign into that laptop, and their old password is still in effect. So they realize their mistake. They sign in with their old password. They work locally on that all weekend. Monday morning, they forget all about that password change when they go back into the office. So they try to sign in with their old password. That doesn't work. They sign in a couple more times or attempt to sign in a couple more times, and bam, they get locked out of their account. So. The whole idea about doing password hash synchronization can help to reduce the chances of that happening. And it just generally makes life easier on your end users. Uh, the more important reason for enabling password hash synchronization is that it makes it a lot easier to find out if on-premises users are using passwords that are known to have been compromised. So there are lists that are maintained both by Microsoft and by a few different third-party companies of passwords that are known to be compromised. And the idea being that if a password is known to be compromised, then it's super vulnerable to attack. Um, because an attacker doesn't have to do anything to try to decrypt that password or to do a brute force attack. They can simply do a table-based lookup and get that password based on its hash. So it's extremely vulnerable at that point. Now, there are tools for Azure Active Directory accounts uh, to compare the passwords that users are using in Azure Active Directory to that list of vulnerable passwords uh, to find out if anybody's using passwords that are vulnerable. The problem is that the native tools that are built in really don't work for on-premises Active Directory accounts. So if instead what you do is you synchronize your on-premises Active Directory to Azure AD and you're also performing password hash synchronization, then you're synchronizing those passwords up to Azure AD so that they can be analyzed as well to find out if any of those passwords are vulnerable.
So another best practice is to enable self-service password reset. Um, again, this was a Microsoft best practice, but this is one of those things that there was quite a bit of overlap with some of the other providers that I looked at. So self-service password reset is exactly what it sounds like for anybody who might not be familiar. It's simply setting up a web portal that will allow users to reset their own passwords. Now, I have to admit that the first few times that I heard about self-service password reset, I thought this just sounds like a bad idea. It seems like something that attackers would exploit. And I have absolutely no doubt that attackers do and have tried to exploit self-service password reset portals. Having said that, though, it, it probably is a good idea to go ahead and use self-service password reset because it can actually do several things to make your organization more secure. For one thing, it might encourage users, and I use the word might, but it might encourage users to use stronger passwords if they're not so worried about forgetting them. Um, you know, I think about back in the early part of my career, I worked corporate help desk, and there were certain users that were chronic about forgetting their passwords. You know, pr practically every Monday morning, they would call and, hey, I can't remember my password. Can you reset it for me? So there was always a, a bit of embarrassment that went along with those phone calls. You could tell that the users were ashamed that they had forgotten their passwords again. So if a user is worried about what people think when they forget their passwords, they're probably going to choose weaker passwords that are easier to remember. But if a user knows that they can reset their own password and they never have to talk to another human and nobody's any the wiser that they forgot their password again, then maybe they're a little bit more apt to use a stronger password because there's no consequences to forgetting the password at that point. Another reason why self-service password is, uh, reset is a good idea is because the help desk staff no longer has to be involved in the password reset process. So think about this one for a moment. A user calls the help desk because they forgot their password, and the help desk will typically go through some sort of validation process to determine that the user is who they claim to be. Uh, maybe they ask them the answer to a, um, maybe they ask them to answer a security question. So they ask the question, the user answers that question. Well, the problem with that is that that help desk employee now knows the answer to that user's security question, and there's nothing stopping them from writing that answer down and using it for whatever purposes you can imagine. But if you enable self-service password reset, then the help desk staff no longer has to be involved. That means that there's no risk of the user's information being compromised by the help desk staff. There is no risk of the help desk staff doing something nefarious. And the help desk staff doesn't even have to have access to change passwords at that point. Maybe you want to go ahead and give somebody on the help desk uh, password reset abilities just in case there's somebody who's not able to use the online portal. But as a general rule, that access isn't even going to be needed. And that goes way back to the principle that I talked about earlier about least privileged access for administrators. Um, another concept is that user identities are thoroughly vetted prior to a reset. So the, the um, validation process works a little bit differently depending on which platform you're going to be using. But the general idea is that when a user needs to reset their password, they're not generally going to be able to just sign in, enter their email address, enter a new password, and be done with it. They're going to have to do something to prove their identity. And normally, that's going to involve multiple steps. So depending on what steps you enable, there's a good chance that that validation process is going to be um, stronger through the password reset portal than maybe what the help desk would have done. And then the last reason on the list is that self-service password resets uh, beat AI voice impersonation. Now, this one requires just a little bit of explaining. Um, as a matter of fact, I hadn't even planned on talking about this, but let me tell you about something that happened many, many years ago. I was visiting my uncle, and while I was at his house, he got a phone call from his grandson. And his grandson said, hey, I got busted selling drugs down in Mexico. I need $5,000 for bail so that I can get out of prison. Well, there were a couple of problems with that. One, his grandson was only about 10 years old at the time, so he was way too young to be selling drugs down in Mexico. The other problem was his grandson was sitting at the table with us. So the call was an obvious fraud. But even though we had a good laugh about it at the time, it still underscores the idea that a scammer was calling, trying to pretend to be someone else and extort money. Now, that was like 30 years ago, but this type of scam still exists in various forms even today. And one of the things that I've been reading about lately is that scammers are now using AI to impersonate people's voices. So what these scammers are doing is they're going out to YouTube or TikTok or whatever and finding videos that somebody has 
recorded and taking an audio sample from those videos and using it to recreate that person's voice and using AI to make it say whatever they wanted to say. And then they can make a phone call convincingly sounding like the person that they're imitating and ask for money or make some sort of demand or do whatever they want. I've actually heard about a few different incidents of this lately. So with that in mind, imagine what would happen if you had one of those users that I talked about earlier that chronically forgets their password. And this is somebody that the help desk constantly deals with. They know this person's voice. And somehow or other, a scammer gets word of that. So they take it upon themselves to create an AI to impersonate that particular user. And they generate an automated call to the help desk of the company that the user works for, impersonating that user's voice, hey, I forgot my password again. I'm so sorry. Can you reset that password for me? Help desk recognizes that user's voice because they talk to them all the time and do a million password resets. They don't think anything of it. They go ahead and reset the password, and bam, what they've actually done is handed the credentials over to an attacker. So even though that's a lot of explanation for that one particular point, it is something that I wanted to be sure and underscore because it's something that's starting to periodically happen from time to time in the real world. But this is the sort of thing that self-service password resets can be. Because if you're requiring your users to reset their own passwords through a portal, then there's absolutely no chance of a help desk servicing a request based on, well, I recognize their voice. I know it's them. Um, I'm not going to bother with making them provide all of this personal information to prove their identity because I, I know their voice. So you don't have to worry about all of that with pass, uh, self-service password reset. So if you do use self-service password reset, which I would recommend doing, uh, just be sure that you're monitoring how it's being used or if it's even being used. Uh, I, I've heard stories of organizations that will um, provide a transition period where they'll still allow a help desk to reset passwords, but they also enable self-service password reset, and they find that users don't even adopt it. They still call the help desk because it's familiar and convenient and that sort of thing. So monitoring can help determine whether that's happening or not. And also, just make sure that you're consistent with your password policies, regardless of whether accounts are on-premises in the cloud or whatever. So the second um, item on the list, and I'm going to have to pick up the pace because I'm only on the second item, is environmental hardening. Um, the basic idea behind environmental hardening is that IAM doesn't exist in a vacuum. There is also a lot of supporting infrastructure that leads to IAM security. And if the supporting infrastructure is compromised, then there's a chance that IAM could become compromised as well. So environmental hardening is all about identifying those vulnerabilities and making sure to shore them up based on the resources that you have available. So what should be hardened? Well, this is going to vary dramatically from one organization to the next. But a few ideas would be domain controllers, uh, Azure AD Connect servers, uh, your cryptographic stores, um, help desk software, again, tying back to the reasons that I explained a moment ago about password resets and that sort of thing, uh, your networks, your backups. And this is by no means a comprehensive list. It's just a few bullet point items to get you thinking. But the basic idea is that you want to identify any deficiencies that may exist and just make sure that you're hardening those. As you do, it's important to make sure that you have an inventory or asset management system in place to, to track your organization's IT assets because you don't want to end up in one of these situations where you've completely forgotten about a particular IT asset and it goes neglected and isn't secured quite the way that it should be. Because remember, you can't secure an asset that you don't know about. And as you're compiling that list, make sure that you're also focusing on any long-lived cloud-based assets. Because when it comes to infrastructure assets that live in the cloud, there's somewhat of a tendency to sometimes think of those assets as being transitory because assets in the cloud can be so rapidly created and deleted and moved and that sort of thing. But if you've got anything long-lived, you definitely want to include that in that asset inventory. Another thing to think about is how any proposed architectural changes could have unintended consequences for your other assets and how they might change the exposure of those assets. So let's say that you make an architectural change on your network. Well, a couple of things could happen. One is it doesn't end up in affecting anything else at all. That's probably the best case. Another is that it could cause a, an asset that was previously isolated to suddenly be exposed. Uh, 
um, in a way that causes a security risk. And then a third possibility is that when you make that architectural change, an asset that was previously exposed is suddenly and unexpectedly isolated. Now, on the surface, that sounds like a really good thing, but the problem with that is that when you have that asset that's suddenly and unexpectedly isolated, it becomes more difficult to monitor that asset because it is isolated. It is essentially in a silo at that point, and it's difficult to secure what you can't see. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit so that I can get through this presentation. Uh, the third uh, category that I want to talk about is Identity Federation and Single Sign-On. Um, the whole goal behind Identity Federation and Single Sign-On should be simplifying things for your end users, but also making sure that you're using centralized authentication. So one of the best practices is, if at all possible, to use a single directory. Um, think of it as one source of the truth, as opposed to having user identities scattered all over the place. Now, sometimes, admittedly, this isn't so realistic, but if you are able to consolidate around a single directory, it's a really good thing to do. Um, you know, as I was putting this slide together, I began to think of one of the first organizations that I ever worked for. It was a large insurance company, and at that point, they were using Novell Netware. I know that's way back when. Uh, but this was back when Novell was doing what was called um, binary-based authentication. In other words, each Netware server had its own collection of user accounts. There was no synchronization across servers or anything. So if you had a user on one server that needed access or resource on another server, you actually had to create an account for that user on that other server. Now, the reason why I mention this is because this is really similar to what we have going on today in the cloud. We have all these different SaaS applications, and typically each one has its own uh, collection of accounts, and that can be a big problem. So if you have a way of consolidating that, whether that be through single sign-on or through using a single directory or a single authentication provider, that's generally going to go a long way toward making your life easier and making identities easier to manage. Um, another best practice is to avoid synchronizing high-privilege Active Directory accounts to Azure AD. So in other words, in any on-premises Active Directory environment, you're going to have certain privileged accounts. And when you deploy Azure AD Connect, accounts in your on-premises Active Directory are going to get synchronized up to Azure AD. Now, there's a default configuration that will prevent any privileged accounts from being synchronized. And that's generally a good thing because those, those accounts serve no purpose up in the cloud. So there's no reason to synchronize them to Azure AD. But that functionality can be disabled so that absolutely everything, excuse me, absolutely all of your accounts end up getting synchronized. So as a best practice, you shouldn't do that. Uh, it's also worth noting that Microsoft recommends that you harden your Azure AD Connect server to the same degree that you would harden a domain controller because it handles the same types of sensitive information. It's also extremely important to make sure that your Azure AD Connect server, if you're using one, is set up in a way to make it highly available. Because if you think about your domain controllers, the recommendation has always been to have multiple domain controllers. So that way, if a domain controller were to fail, you've got other domain controllers that continue to service user workloads. Well, Azure AD Connect um, doesn't follow the same model. If your Azure AD Connect uh, server goes down, it's just down. So as a best practice, Microsoft recommends that you ensure resilience by taking steps to make that highly available. Uh, maybe you want to put it in a virtual machine and make the virtual machine highly available. That's certainly one way of accomplishing that. Um, another best practice is to set up a policy that disallows local accounts on any, any platform. And the reason for this is simple. Local accounts are one of those things that is sometimes exploited in an effort to gain access to the uh, hashes for domain accounts. And it's really difficult to adequately secure large numbers of local accounts and to monitor those accounts and how they're being used. So as a best practice, try to disable local accounts if at all possible. Another best practice is to enable single sign-on. Uh, this was one of those best practices that was consistent across all of the different um, best practices lists that I looked at when I was preparing this presentation. Uh, the idea is that using single sign-on decreases the chances of a user reusing a password on multiple sites. 
And it also helps encourage users to use strong passwords because they only have one password to remember at that point. But if you are going to use single sign-on, uh, make sure that you have high availability for your single sign-on system. Because if that single sign-on system were to go down, then all the related systems also become inaccessible at that point. So what should you be doing right now with regard to single sign-on? Well, the first step if you're looking to implement single sign-on is just to assess your organization's internal on-premises applications, devices, platforms, and your cloud provider's ability to connect using single sign-on. And when I say cloud providers, I'm not just talking about uh, hyperscaler clouds. I'm also talking about any SaaS applications that you happen to be using. Uh, see if they're going to be compatible with the single sign-on solution that you're looking at. It's also important to determine if your single sign-on integration can collect user context information during single sign-on uh, logins. So that means looking at things like location, device, behavior, and things like that so that you're not simply performing a allow deny based on the user's credentials. You're also looking at other things that might help you to contextually make a decision as to whether or not it's in your best interest to allow access to that resource. Uh, so the, another category of threat mitigation techniques was multi-factor authentication. And I don't want to go too deeply into this one because I think most people are familiar with multi-factor authentication and I'm quickly running out of time. But one thing that I do want to stress is that all of the providers out there that I looked at encourage the use of multi-factor authentication. But multi-factor authentication, even though it can mitigate several different types of attacks, it's not infallible. There are ways of beating multi-factor authentication challenges. And multi-factor authentication also comes in several different flavors, with some forms of multi-factor authentication being more secure than others. So as a general rule, multi-factor authentication can be categorized as something you have plus something you know plus something that you are. Uh, something you have might be a device. Something you know might be a password. Something that you are could be biometrics. So when I said that there were several different forms of multi-factor authentication with some being uh, more secure than others, uh, this chart, which came from that U.S. government website that I pointed out at the very beginning of the presentation, uh, shows multi-factor authentication solutions ranging from the weakest to the strongest. So the weakest are SMS, that's text messaging, or voice multi-factor authentication. And then in the middle we have app-based multi-factor authentication. And then on the far right side of the screen, the strongest are phishing-resistant multi-factor authentication solutions. That includes things like FIDO and public key infrastructure-based solutions. So I want to kind of go back to that topic a little bit and talk about why is SMS-based multi-factor authentication so weak. Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is that an attacker could simply steal a user's phone. I mean, think about how many users do a lot of work from their phones. So if they're trying to sign on from their phone and the multi-factor authentication prompt is designed to send a text message to that same phone, well then anybody who's in possession of that phone could conceivably access that user's resource. So that's a problem. The other issue is that SMS-based multi-factor authentication is vulnerable to interception. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you take a look at the screen, there's a lot going on here, um, but the, there are three panes. The middle pane just shows the Microsoft website. I went out to uh, Microsoft.com and just took a screenshot. That's all that is. So what I did after I had that page up was I pressed F12, and that caused the pane shown on the left side of the screen to be displayed. And what this does is opens the Microsoft Developer Tools. So you press F12, and then you click on Open Dev Tools, and then that gives you the pane that you see on the right. What that is is the source code that was used to render that page. So attackers use this technique to their advantage because if you've got the source code that's used to render a web page and you've also got the images that go into that page, because remember, downloading those images is a normal part of rendering the page, so those images certainly aren't protected or anything, well, then it's really easy to set up a fake website that looks exactly like the legitimate one. Incidentally, um, you may have done online banking and gone to a bank's website and noticed them uh, playing a video behind the login prompt. Th this isn't done purely for advertising purposes. It's done for security reasons because it's a whole lot more difficult for an attacker to set up a fake web page if that web page renders a video in the background as opposed to 
just displaying a static picture because a static picture will get downloaded to your browser, whereas a video is something that gets streamed. So it's a lot harder for an attacker to impersonate a site if they're doing the video in the background. So at any rate, the technique that I showed you right here makes it really easy for an attacker to set up a page that looks exactly like someone that they want to mimic. So they set up a fake site, and then they redirect a user to that site. And this can be done through any number of different ways. Uh, they might do a DNS poisoning attack where they change a DNS record to uh, point uh, the user's browser toward the fake site. Uh, they might use malware to redirect somebody to, to a fake site. There are in any number of different ways of getting the user to their site. But the purpose of this fake site is to gain the attacker access to the legitimate site that the fake site is impersonating. So they get the user to the fake site, they trick the user into thinking that they're on the legitimate site, and ask the user to log on. So the user goes to the logon prompt, they enter their username, they enter their password. So upon clicking Submit, the attacker captures that username and password. So at that point, they have the user's credentials. What the attacker does then is they'll forward those credentials to the real site. Um, that real site is going to enter or is going to generate a multi-factor authentication prompt. Now the user thinks that they're signing into the real site, so they're fully expecting that MFA challenge. So that MFA challenge gets sent to the user's phone. They receive the text message with the code. They type the code in, but they're entering that code into the fake site. So the attacker sees that code as it gets entered into the fake site, and then they just capture that code and enter it into the real site. At that point, they disconnect the user's uh, connection to the fake site, and then they move forward with signing into the real site. So at that point, the attacker has gained access to that particular site, even though that site used multi-factor authentication. So all of that is to say that there is a way of beating multi-factor authentication. And that's just one example. There are other techniques that can be used. So the point is that multi-factor authentication is important. It does ward off a number of different types of attacks, but it's not 100% perfect. So you don't want to place all of your trust in multi-factor authentication and assume that credential theft could never happen because you're using multi-factor authentication. So I'm getting really close to being out of time, but I do want to touch on that fifth category that I talked about at the beginning. And that category is monitoring and auditing. So the goal behind this is self-explanatory. It's to collect and analyze information and to detect anything that falls outside of the normal expected behavior. So one of the things that I've talked about from time to time in some of the webcasts that I've done is the way that Las Vegas casinos run their table games. Now, I'm not a gambler myself, but this is something that I've seen time and time again. The idea being that if you go to a casino, it doesn't matter which table you go to, the dealers are going to deal the games in an extremely consistent and methodical manner. And the reason for this is that it causes anything out of the ordinary to stand out. You've probably seen in movies where a guy moves his thumb the wrong way in a poker game and all of a sudden security is all over him. Well, that can happen in real life, and the reason why that's possible is because that thumb movement falls outside of the normal um, scripted way of dealing a game, so it stands out to security. So that's what monitoring and auditing should be all about. In other words, doing everything in an extremely uniform manner so that anything abnormal really stands out, and setting your audit logs and filtering up so that you detect that abnormality. Now, I talked earlier about the transition away from perimeter-based security in favor of using identity as the new perimeter. Now, having said that, that doesn't mean that location is completely unimportant because a lot of organizations do still maintain an on-premises environment. And there are certain things that you can look for based on that idea uh, that might show you that things are amiss. One of the things is impossible travel. Uh, let's say that your office is in New York and you've got a user who came into the office, they left half an hour ago, and all of a sudden they're signing on from California. Well, they could be using a VPN, that might explain it, or it could be that their credentials were compromised and it's actually an attacker in California trying to sign in. Um, another thing to look for is improbable locations. Okay, you've got a user who comes into the office every day and they go on vacation, and while they're on vacation, they try signing in from some rogue nation on the other side of the planet. Um, well, it's entirely possible that they went to that location on or to that country on vacation, but it's not likely, especially with travel embargoes and things like that. So that's an example of improbable location. Uh, other things to look for might be sign-ins from an infected device. Uh, 
uh, sign-ins from anonymous IP addresses or from IP addresses that are commonly associated with rogue activity, uh, sign-ins from completely unfamiliar locations, or sign-ins after multiple failed login attempts. You know, if you've got somebody who has tried to sign in seven or eight times and then all of a sudden they get it, well, that might just be a user remembering that they changed their password and that they were entering a password from another site or something like that and they finally get it right, or it could be a sign of a password spray attack. And then sign-ins from multiple regions. Um, none of these indicate a problem with the possible exception of impossible travel. Uh, none of these indicate a problem in every situation 100% of the time but they are certainly things that warrant taking a more serious look at it uh, to see if a problem exists. And of course, some of these are more serious than others, so you don't necessarily want to treat them all the same way. So even though uh, monitoring and auditing isn't technically a part of IAM, it is one of those supplementary components that I mentioned earlier. So reviewing your audit logs is critically important to maintaining the integrity of your IAM system. So there are certain types of events that you should be on the lookout for within those audit logs. I'm talking about things like password resets, uh, registration activities, um, meaning somebody's registering a new device for use on your network, um, self-service group activity. If somebody's out there um, unexpectedly joining groups and things like that, that may be perfectly benign. That might, might be part of the normal workflow, or it could be somebody um, who's up to no good. Um, changing the name of a Microsoft 365 group, uh, any activity associated with privileged identity management or device uh, registration. Also, be sure to look for uh, and to audit account provisioning activity and any errors that are associated with that. Because remember what I said at the very beginning of this presentation. It's a good idea to use orchestration anytime that you're dealing with user accounts, whenever possible. So, if an attacker were to infiltrate your network and gain access to a privileged account, one of the first things that they'll sometimes do is to create additional accounts so that if the password gets changed on the account that they've compromised, no problem. They've got other accounts that, they, that they've created that they know they're going to be able to sign in with. So if you're using account orchestration, then something like a manual account creation is probably going to draw your attention, or at least it should. And then finally, the very last slide, make sure that you periodically re revisit the best practices that you're implementing because the things that are best practices today aren't necessarily going to be best practices in the future because things change over time. Um, for example, there was a time not all that long ago when a best practice was to make sure that users change their passwords every 30 days or every 90 days or whatever. And today, most security professionals recommend against forced um, password changes just on a, on a frequent basis uh, for no other reason than because 30 days have elapsed. So that's an example of a best practice that's changed over time. There are also changes in technology. So the single sign-on solution that you implement today might not necessarily be secure in the, in the future. It might require a different protocol in order to remain secure or something like that. And we've seen examples of that over time. Uh, VPNs, for example, when they first cam came out, uh, used the PPTP uh, protocol, but over time those evolved to use um, different protocols such as IPsec that are known to be more secure. So make sure that you periodically revisit those best practices and make sure that they're still relevant. So with that said, I've covered a huge amount of material and not a lot of time, but I'd like to go ahead and use this <laughs> last couple of minutes and take some questions. <laughs> You bet, man, uh, an embarrassment of riches. Okay, first question uh, from Vic. Is it time for the Active Directory to completely go away and be fully replaced by Azure AD? No, I don't think so. Um, Active Directory and Azure AD aren't necessarily designed to do the same things. Uh, there are things that the Active Directory can do for your on-premises environment that uh, Azure AD just can't do. Uh, for example, applying group policies to domain joined devices. That's not something that you're generally going to be able to do with Azure AD. Okay. Um, here's one. Uh, since you can't disable a break glass account, what is the best way to protect it? Uh, the best thing that I can think of is make sure that you're using the longest, most complicated password you can possibly come up with, and then print that out, make sure there's only one copy of it, and store it in an extremely secure location, uh, fireproof vault somewhere, uh, something like that. 
uh, and that should only be accessed in a dire emergency. You never, ever, ever want to use that account for it, um, any other purpose. Okay. Here's one from David is wondering, what are your thoughts on PIM versus admin account? Uh, I don't know. Is there any elaboration there um, as far as what it is that they're looking for? Um, David, if you want to restate the question, we'll give it another try. Um, here's one from Gabriel. Do you recommend using using Azure AD as uh, Okta IDP? I'm sorry, can you say that again? You bet. Um, do you recommend using Azure AD as Okta IDP? As Okta, did you say? Yeah, O-K-T-A-I-D-P. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know what that means either, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with Okta IDP. I, I don't even understand the question. Okay, sorry, Gabriel. So here's one from, um, let's see here, um, Athanavan, who's wondering, uh, we go, you know, you know uh, that's not do that one. Okay, here's kind of a long one. Microsoft recommends having dedicated admin stations and only allowing privileged accounts to log on for those stations. Is uh, such a recommendation practical? It really kind of depends on the environment that you're working in. Uh, what I would recommend doing is if you're trying to follow those recommended best practices from Microsoft and use admin accounts only for privileged operations, nothing else, and use dedicated workstations, what I would generally recommend doing is setting up a virtual machine on the machine that the admin does their normal work from. So that way that virtual machine, which is just as secure as a physical machine can be used for the admin um, stuff. The rest of the machine can be used for the day-to-day -day stuff, and the admin's not burdened with having multiple PCs sitting on their desk. Okay. Um, let's see. And just to clarify, you know what Okta is, right? Me? Yeah. I'm not familiar with the term. The um, Yeah, this is this thing. Uh. Yeah, but I'm so sorry. I wanted to do a better job of explaining it, and I'm going to pass on that too. Let's see. We've got um, uh, what, okay. What are your thoughts on Tim? You know what? I think that's about all the time we have. Yikes! I'm getting the uh, the flag here that we've got to wrap it up. Thank you, Brian. Um, you got an awful lot in in a little short time, and. Uh, Answer a bunch of good questions. Uh, many thanks to Brian Posey for a great session and to our sponsor, Zoho, sponsors, Zoho and Tools Forever for making it possible.